in the morning session, Martin Siqueira from Argentina. Let's applaud all at once, okay, at the end, <laughs> to not be unfair. So representatives of the Friedrich Ebert Foundation and Rosa Luxemburg Foundation here in Brazil. Pietro Laura Alcon of Colombia, Rodrigo Andres Alvarez, also from Colombia, Rafael Hidalgo from Cuba, Blanca Bonilla from El Salvador, Santiago Flores of El Salvador, Chema Guijaro already mentioned, Maite Mola, Vice President of the European Socialist Party, Virgilio Hernandez from Ecuador, Nectarius Bogdanis from Syriza, Yoav Golding from Israel, Ricardo Cantu from Mexico, Alba Palacios, Benavides, Carlos Fonseca Teran, Jose Antonio Zepeta from Nicaragua as well, Nazaya Bersenho from Peru, Alda Garcia, Alberto Quintanilha, all from Peru, João Pimenta from Portugal, Isabel Moreira present here, Javier Miranda present, Martin Gravijo from Uruguay, Rony Corvo, Edwin Diaz from Venezuela, Roy Tassa from Venezuela, and from Uruguay, Eduardo Menedes and Ismael Suite from Uruguay, Smith, also from Uruguay. Also greet the all those present uh, who are following our event via YouTube and Facebook. The event will carry on being streamed this afternoon. So let us discuss this afternoon democratic and progressive responses that we must build. We have some limitations. We have to conclude this panel at four because we have to go to San Bernardo. So we really have to finish at 3.59, okay? The second point is that our brother, Chema Guijaro, has to leave at three. So we're going to give each of the speakers 15 minutes. That's what we agreed. But I want to start with you, Chema, so you can give your presentation. Then hopefully it will be present for you to be part of the debate. And if not possible, we thank you all the same for the long trip that you uh, made the effort of making. So comrade Chema, 15 minutes, please. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak Spanish. I'm afraid I cannot speak Portuguese slowly. And hopefully, this will allow the interpreters to do their job better. I would like to thank the Workers' Party, the Brazilian comrades, for the invitation, for this call to, to resist. We are uh, very pleased to take part in. I also want to send a message to our brother Lula, our comrade in Spain. We are following up his case. Everything that happens to this uh, comrade of ours, we wish him all, all the strength, and we trust that at the end of the day that justice will prevail. And I cannot fail to mention as well two uh, comrades from MST, Rodrigo Celestino, José Bernardo da, Cido, da Silva, uh, cowardly murdered. The murderers may think that we're going to fear them, 
but they have given us two more reasons to stay in the struggle until we defeat them. So, José Bernardo, Muril, our homage to you. I would like to begin mentioning Walter Benjamin, the great Walter Benjamin, this intellectual who was a victim of fascism, one of the most brilliant intellectuals that Europe produced in the first half of the 20th century, ended up uh, succumbing to the claws of fascism. We know what he faced. So I'm going to give you this. He left us this reflection, and I hope it will become clear what I, the reason why I'm mentioning him over the course of my remarks. So the rise of fascism is a testimony to the failure of the revolution. I think he's right. I'm going to try to explain why. Before going into details, I'm going to um, make a methodological note. So first thing to say is that I, I'm not full of certainties. I have above all questions and doubts and some reflections. And when I bring the point of view that is the very concrete, I'm, I'm here to, to, to convey to you a point of view of somebody who is experiencing a given set of circumstances in his home state, in his home country of Spain. So you know Spain had a 40-year fascist dictatorship, and not just one, but the same took the half million lives into the civil war, 150,000 um, 150,000 dead during the, 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 the during the repression of the dictatorship. So after Cambodia, Spain is the country with the most people that are in mass graves. We thought this had vaccinated us from fascism. So who can embrace fascist ideas when its people has paid such a heavy price for their freedom. And nevertheless, I don't know if you know, but a few days ago in Andalusia region, the poorest region of Spain, a party with fascistic uh, uh, features uh, achieved a spectacular result with 12 uh, members of the regional parliament. This was a political earthquake in our country, and in many regards, we in the left in Spain, we are still stunned by this result, doing our best to reflect on this result, to understand what happened um, while feeling the pain deep in our hearts. What happened in Andalusia, or is happening in Spain in general, is not the same, for example, as what is happening in Italy, I believe, or Germany. What do I mean? Uh, Spanish fascism, such as it emerged, is not anti-neoliberal as, for example, the Salvini's uh, Northern League in Italy seems to be, or the ultra-right that is emerging in Germany. In many regards, it's the fascism of that we've always had, with the only difference that now they've taken off the mask. But it's still fascist. It's an old-fashioned fascism. What do I mean? This is a line of debate that I want to introduce. It will be polemical. But I think this space must be good for that to understand, to debate, to explain, if possible, what we should do. Why do I say that the far right in Spain is not a modern ultra-right, as the Italian ultra-right may 
seem to be. It's because it's openly neoliberal. They don't doubt the European project. They don't doubt, they don't question the economic system. They don't question anything except the social advances that were have been produced in Spain in recent years. And therefore, it's a, a dividing line that is important to understand. The ultra-right that is rising in it in Europe have these two characteristics. Some are more openly neoliberal, openly anti-neoliberal, and others are pro-neoliberal, pro-European system, however you want to call it. So we must understand also the emergence of fascism in Spain based on two very specific phenomena. Firstly, as you will know, Spain, there was an, an intent of one region to break away from the country, Catalonia, which obviously exacerbated the nationalist impulses that we thought had been domesticated. And then we saw the emergence of a, a rancid nationalism precisely because of the episodes of Catalonia in recent years, particularly in the last year. The other phenomenon that also explains the emergence of fascism in Spain has to do with the fact that Spain, as you will know, is a border between the African continent and the European continent. And this, to the extent that there are migratory flows that are constant, also fed into a certain type of discourse that ended up uh, prospering in the Andalusian region, which is in the south of the country, in other words, closest to North Africa. Therefore, we cannot say that uh, this is a populistic uh, phenomenon. It's not. When we use the populist uh, terminologist, we are talking about the sense of Karopolenji, the meaning I use to talk about this phenomenon of populism. As Polenji would say, populism is nothing but a popular reaction of the modernization process that is ahead of them. This is populism. Therefore, you can have uh, a left uh, side to it, a left vert into it, and a right vert into it. So in the, the party, we say we are left-wing populists. We react towards a movement that is called new liberalism that has brought precariousness and poverty, and we rebel against that, and we call ourselves populists. Now, this is not the discourse of far right in Spain, and therefore we think that we have to set this difference clearly, the definition of populism, and perhaps Quite too often, we use uh, the term as an insult without understanding exactly what people are saying. So sometimes we say populism, and people think of demagogy. And it has nothing to do. One thinks one thing, the other thing is the other. Now, going back to our understanding, why this is not a populist movement in Spain. I would say first because there is no reaction against new liberalism. Uh, 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 the, whatever they are called, they say they are friends of uh, the European integration process that uh, uh, in the end of the day is behind uh, this uh, reactions that are going through the continent from east to west, north to south. And it's not a populist phenomenon because in the strict sense, it does not feed itself from abstention. Uh, let's say that uh, orthodox, if we can say that populist uh, movements 
are fed by mobilizing a social segment, generally the medium low income segment that was not part of the political segment. So there is a call for action so that they can engage themselves and they respond to the call and add to the movement. This is not what happened with Vox. Uh, with Vox. Vox has been fed by the right throughout its life, throughout its history. Now, in Spain, we have three right-wing parties. First, we had the Partido Popular, that was the major mainstream uh, party that uh, accumulated all kinds of rights, more liberal, more moderate, Christian uh, rights, and those that long for uh, far-right regiments, what we call fachas. I don't know what you call them in Brazil, but we refer to them as fachas uh, in an allusion to fascism. And that's what happened. Basically, what I believe happened is the following. This segment of the Spanish uh, uh, right wing that uh, longed for uh, the dictatorship of Franco has been uh, repressed for many years. And now it has uncovered itself, removing the mantle of uh, social uh, skills and shows itself completely fascist. And this has been a struggle in Spain for many years. In the past, we had to explain why we had a far right sector inside the right wing. Today, that explanation is no longer necessary. It's clear. So going on with my reflection, in three minutes, I'm going to close my talk. But I will try first to, to try to bring some answers to the questions of this panel. Um, attempts, uh, uh, possibilities of work, as we can say, because uh, uh, we are not the ones that hold all certainties. I would say that uh, I'm uh, um, just willing to discuss elements. So what kind of answer uh, could we come up with to the issues that are placed in this panel? First, we have to use what uh, left-wing uh, thinkers thought of uh, the counter-revolutionary way. Rosa Luxemburg, Trotsky said that it was important that the revolution had to have a counter-revolutionary act. We needed an enemy so that we could face ourselves. So we have to seize this opportunity now. We have an enemy ahead of us. It is a clear animal, uh, enemy. We know who we have to fight against. And second, I think this is one of the hot topics that we have in Spain now. Where do we set up the dividing line? As Carl Smith said, where should we address? Many companions say that we have to establish a line between democratic parties, and here I'm including the populist and Sidanus uh, parties that are right-wing parties, and then Vox, which is a far-right movement. I don't think that the divide line shouldn't be there. In Spain, the traditional right has fed the speech of the far right. So I think this divide should go beyond the right, because this is what we want. We want to address the base. And then we have a dilemma. We have to tell them. It is either with us and with democracy or with the right. So it's not a matter of language any longer. It is not having a semi-democratic agenda or a democratic agenda. 
It, we are talking about a right that wants to impose its objectives no matter what it costs. And we have to build an alternative that is a left-wing alternative that appeals to citizens that belong and feel social democrat to work with us. And now we have the objective to elect among the left-wing Democrats whatever was in the hands of Vox. And to close, I have two final thoughts to leave you with it. How can we succeed to bring or appeal to this resistance that we want to build? How can we appeal to the youngsters? We talk about uh, patriotics, uh, being patriotic about our nation differently from being patriotic of flags. We have to be patriotic in feeding our people, in giving them the option to study, to survive, to have hope. And therefore, we cannot reduce patriotism to a symbolic item. So we have to appeal to this idea that people have to feel that the fight we bring is not a fight that is esoteric. It is a fight of the day-to-day. -day. It's a day-to-day -day struggle. And we are contacting the government to impose social measures, the increase of the minimum wage, things that people can notice in their pockets. We are working with the most important cities of Spain, Madrid, Barcelona, Cadi, Zaragoza, that are now under our control. And cities that miraculously, when we started to rule, the light continued to light, the water continued to run, things continue to exist. But still, there were, on top of that, social services, a police that is on behalf of people to protect them, and etc. So it's very important to talk about the usefulness of the political program we defend. And finally, and I'm going to end here, this is not only this is enough. It cannot be only being patriotic or bringing foods to the people. Rosario has said that beautifully before. She was saying that uh, the left cannot lose a bit of mysticism because it's not just an appeal to rationale, but we have to appeal to people that long for some symbols and values and utopias. What is the utopia we want? Our utopia is a republican utopian, clearly anti-monarchic. But this is just a procedure. What is the concrete content of what we defend? I would say there are two basic foundations. Feminism, which is not only ideology that talks about the equality of gender, but it is a new way to understand politics. And that's what we want, uh, and how this is how we want to understand politics in Spain. A policy that takes care of people, that is fraternal, that understands that conflict is against those on the top, and not the last against the one before the last. And the second foundation, ecology. The planet is in terrible shape, just on the verge of cataclysm. Economic uh, exchanges are no longer an aspiration, a desire, but a true need. And therefore, these two foundations, feminism and ecology, can help us build a new country, a new government. And that is why we struggle every day. Again, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Okay, well, I will go 
straight to Ambassador Celso Morin for his talk. Well, good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure and honor to be part of this panel with our comrades from Uruguay, Portugal, and Spain. In addition to Antonio Lisboa, first, I would also like to pay tribute to the militants of MST that were killed. This is a terrible announcement of what uh, can come with a far-right government in Brazil. Uh, these things already happened in other situations, but they can deteriorate uh, deeply if they are not punished. And also, I would like to uh, call uh, on an essential topic. We are talking about democracy. We are talking about the human rights. Today is the day of human rights, so we cannot fail to say Lula Livre. This is uh, the strongest symbol of democracy in Brazil at this point in time, the freedom of President Lula. I will start perhaps even provoked by the idea that uh, were exposed before me. I had uh, asked if you were from Galicia, because then it would be easier for you to understand my Portuguese. But anyway, similarities and differences of the far right in some European countries, and I know that, that they are also uh, different apart to one another, and Brazil. I would start with a similarity that was raised, which is kind of curious, that uh, uh, is different from other right-wing countries of more developed countries. Not that Spain is uh, not a developed country, but differently from France, uh, Germany, and Italy, and the United Kingdom. And uh, what I'm talking about is this trend of fascism in our countries, in Spain and Brazil, taking over this position of new liberal. Generally, fascism is characterized, or at least tries to be characterized, by a certain degree of nationalism. And as it was very well put, nationalism here is just nationalism of flags and anthems, but not related to the economic reality. I'm not even talking about foods to our people, which is a social aspect. But it's not even nationalism that is defended by national entrepreneurs. People in Brazil, for instance, talk about privatization. Privatization is the wrong number. What they're talking about is denationalization. There is not one single uh, Brazilian uh, entrepreneur that is interested in buying into the electric sector or um, um, oil wells. They may be interested in the uh, sugarloaf trolley or not even that. So they are interested in denationalization. And the right wing flag included privatization to the extreme, privatization raised to the 11th power. Uh, that never uh, happened in Brazil ago. Perhaps it did have some approach similar to that in the administrations of Fernando Henrique and Collor, but not to this level. So it is uh, curious that uh, the Brazilian uh, far right has, very similar to what you said about the far right in Spain. Um, uh, to be nationalists, uh, uh, nationalistic just about symbols, but not about its substance. But there probably is a difference. I don't know if it's a real difference or a difference of perception. But I would say that would be interesting to highlight that in our case, in the case of Brazil, and you didn't mention that in your talk, is the role of elements out of Brazil, that is foreign elements influencing the far right in Brazil. The far right in Brazil uh, 
stemmed from conservatism. Conservatism is not the same thing as far right, but conservatives uh, uh, um, became the instrument of ascension of far right, whether voluntarily or not. But that was not a completely endogenous process. It was something connected to a global trend. And it would be very difficult to have a very detailed analysis of different segments. But people connect to the essential of financial capital in the world. And what Chomsky says for financial capital, democracy is not only useless, it is detrimental, clearly detrimental, when it enables the claims of popular masses to be heard. So it seems unarguable, if we are going to analyze the situation of Brazil and how it evolved, that there was an obvious foreign interest in changing regimes in Brazil, first with the coup against President Dilma and then the arrest of President Lula, all that connected to a progressive, so to speak, project in Brazil. So I don't know to what extent this ex exists in Spain, but this external influence is a determinant in the Brazilian case, of course trying to make the most of the divisions and of the prejudices of the Brazilian elite. So this was through an intellectual hegemony and many tools, including economic tools, uh, political agreements, judicial agreements, but also making the most of this external influence without a foreign occupation, in other words. So an attitude of the Brazilian elites and international financial capital generated a situation that led initially to what would seem like a conservative reaction. And we have to draw a distinction here, again, between the conservative reaction and the far right. Yes, there was a conservative reaction, <clears throat> and served as an instrument to the far right, but not necessarily it aimed to let the far right take power. It doesn't seem that everything that happened in the judiciary, in the media level, to delegitimize the, the, the progressive project uh, embodied by Presidents Dilma and, and, and Lula and the progressive parties in general, all this effort to delegitimize was done with a major participation of foreign interests that used our judiciary, used our media, various instruments. But they, maybe they did not imagine that the result would be a far-right solution. And then another element comes in connected to something that was mentioned before, which was Populism. I think this is still up for debate, and these terms very often uh, can fool us. So, populism in the 19th century Russia had one meaning. So, Peron and Vargas were accused of populism were of a different kind. The populism of the European right is another meaning, yet again. So, it's very hard to use the same word for all of these things. Podemos calls itself populist in a positive sense. I think Lulaism, not to mention the Workers' Party, it's also populist in the good sense. And what is that sense of that there is a direct communication with the masses, the most needy in society, many of which are not organized? One of the things that draws one's attention in Brazil and impressed people a lot is that President Lula would have won easily in, in any electoral scenario. In the worst scenarios, he would go to the second round, and then he would win in the second round. And what happened was that even in the outside of the northeast of Brazil, where Lula would win, for example, in the peripheral areas of the major cities, the victor was the candidate of the far right. So he was able to capture some element of communication with the masses that we have to study and understand. It's not enough to just deny it. 
it's horrible what happened, but it happened. It's real. I'm from Rio. I live in Rio. I almost stood for governor. It's a good thing that I wasn't. No, not the problem would not be losing because I would have been humiliated. The guy who won in Rio 15 days before the election, I hadn't heard of him. And I was a pre-candidate. I hadn't heard his name. So the idea of the use of these new methods of communication, Facebook, WhatsApp, fake to d disseminate fake news, not just to destroy but to also to construct a candidate is an extraordinarily new phenomenon that we need to study and understand. So why do I say this? From the technical point of view, how was this arrived at, but also studied and understood from the psychological point of view? Because what is most uh, surprising is fake news. It's probably mentioned this morning. It's how vulnerable people are to vote fake news, how prone they are to accepting them. So what explains this predisposition, this propensity for many people who would have voted for Lula to accept these fake news and these um, messages? So we have to understand that in depth. If we don't understand that, it's, we, we, don't, we're not, we don't have to do the same as them, but we have to understand what they did. There's a curious phenomenon here, which is that these fake news are characterized. Nazism also had this characteristic with the technological conditions of the time. So it is not aimed at reason. It is aimed only at emotion. So traditional conservatism, we can disagree with their arguments, but they were aimed at reason. So you can counterpose to one speech another one. What the populist right did in Brazil, there's no discourse. There's nothing to counterpose. You can believe it or not believe it. It's a completely different phenomenon. It's not to discuss, agree, disagree. It's believe or not believe. And believing and not believing depends much less on what is in the content than on who sends it. So a phenomenon, so it's a regression. I talked about this the other day. There's a phenomenon of regression almost to the Middle Ages. So you believe, because the authority is not necessarily who is in power, but is an uncle, a religious leader, doesn't matter which religion. So if since the message comes from that leader, that person with authority, it is intrinsically true, even though they are completely absurd. The message is, the content is completely absurd. So we didn't exploit sufficiently this or that discourse. Yes, it's true. We didn't do certain things. We had to discuss employment more, things that are more interesting to people. But it wouldn't have been enough, in my opinion, because the way things were put, the rational discourse, which is a characteristic, an intrinsic characteristic of democracy, you can have more right wing, more left wing, but there is a discourse. OK, there's, there's always been a little bit of fake news. This wasn't invented now. There's the lyrics of Cambalache, that famous uh, uh, Argentinian song, given that the 20th century is shit, etc. But it's always been a little bit of that. But now it was a qualitative change. So, President, Mr. President, um, Madam President, thank you very much. To, thank you for coming. Uh, maybe I have to improve my speech now. So. So the in-depth establishment of the hegemonic power, the great power, the United States acted for a progressive option to be hamstrung, which led to Dilma's uh, uh, overthrow and Lula's arrest with the support of the local elites and the judiciary elite, but it's not the same. The difference is between them. They were different people that supported the Bolsonaro's campaign. They're different foreign actors. There are other sources of power that are connected to financial capital but represent tendencies that are a little different, which are, you know, 
Steve Bannon, Trump, who is openly seen as an example. When Trump was elected, I remember I was traveling. I think I was in Spain, in fact. And the Brazilian magazine, Carta Capital, wanted me to write an article because I had been foreign affairs minister. I can't write an article. Well, an interview. OK. So I said, the worst of Trump is the example. It's not what he's going to do in relation to Brazil. Because a little more protectionist, a little less protectionist, what's better, what's worse for Brazil, Democrats, Republicans from the economic point of view. But that's not the main thing. The, the, it's the example. The biggest so-called democracy in the world. A person like Trump is elected. It can be elected anywhere else, right? And very significant that now in Brazil, they've just had this event of the far right in Brazil. The conservatives were not very international. Now they're starting to, to network internationally. That includes people like the PP in Spain, the worst half of it, but also a far right, which is completely different. And it's interesting that I think by a Chilean right winger who is to the right of Pinheira, he said that Bolsonaro's uh, victory is a major example. So the examples keep getting worse and worse. So imagine this guy from Chile, if that is possible, he's probably worse than Bolsonaro. Anyway, so the example of Trump has already generated to a large extent, not through only the example, but the way of politicking, not just through the technical means, but this appeal, this easy appeal to emotion and the argument, not of reason, but of authority, the source of the information being a source of authority. This applies to the far right in Europe and Brazil, although the connections with the outside world are probably different and require better analysis, more in-depth analysis. So I've already rambled on and ended up not talking about what I had prepared, which is the democratic responses. But I think that friends say to raise the problems is part of the result. So if we can't put the problem correctly on the table, we won't be able to solve it. So to have the will to resolve is, is good, but it's not enough. So we have to understand what is going on and understand the differences here in Brazil. There's a bit of a gray area, but conserv the conservatism, which is the, the normal, so-called normal conservatism, and the far right. So today we have this alliance of the most conservative uh, sectors of the economy the agro build, agribusiness, for instance, are supporting Bolsonaro, uh, which is paradoxical because they benefited very much from the policies of of uh, Dilma and Lula because they're more wor worried about the one millimeter of land they might s lose, quote unquote, lose to indigenous people or to the peasantry than with the billions of dollars that they are making, selling meat to the Arab world, to Russia, selling soy to, to, to China, etc., etc. And also the neo-Pentecostals that have this appeal to, to authority. There's no other explanation such as the gubernatorial election result in Rio. So they were able to, imp to propel, to, to to, to propel, to drive forward names that were completely unknown. Previously, when, when people were going to vote for an unknown, unknown person, they would vote for uh, these folkloric figures or even to zoo animals. Um, now they are voting to, for people who are appointed, uh, who are suggested and disseminated by this uh, ultra-conservative right. We have many contradictions. One thing is to, to have the far right in, in, on, the, on the rise, which is what ha is happening in Andalusia. There's something different is to have them in office, in power. 
I think your analysis cannot fail to take this into account. When the far right is in power of all the contradictions that exist between rich and poor, blacks and white, Brazil has a huge and underestimated problem, even by the left, is a very serious problem, and gender, I think with race it's even worse. As well as these contradictions, you have contradictions within the democratic state and a state where there is no freedom. So the moment in Brazil, like it or not, demands a broad democratic front where the dividing line, which you call the cordon sanitaire, will have to go a little bit to the right because otherwise we won't survive. So the first duty in a situation, a pre-fascist situation, is survival. And as a function, as a result of this need for survival, I think we have to discuss our political strategy. Thank you, Celso. Um, so chairing a panel such as this one is never a, a nice thing. I gave him an extra three minutes to the first two panelists, so obviously uh, now our comrade Isabel, after 15, I will tell you, you have three more minutes, okay, if you wish. Please, go ahead. So thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you to the foundation, to the Lula Livre Committee. So as we're talking about feminism as a way of conducting politics, I would like to say that yesterday I was in Sao Paulo. I went to the 8th of May occupation, which is part of the movement for the fight for housing. I met amazing women there, women who are part of the movement of the occupation. They are the strength of the movement that restructure those complexes that have been completely abandoned abandoned, and they win over a roof for themselves, but also not just to having a house, but also for their life stories. A woman said that Lola freed her father that was part of the landless movement and that she had finally, and he had finally the right to uh, a, a, a roof and President Dilma freed her from the second form of slavery with a l change in the law for domestic workers. So you used to work from six in the morning till midnight, having some time off every two weeks, more or less. And when I heard these women talking yesterday, I, I remembered when somebody stated that women will have a fundamental role in the resistance. And yesterday, that was very clear to me. And I also remembered that that even though the Bolsonaro uh, government wants to undo the role of black women, poor women, peripheral women, the woman of the year for the Time magazine was Maria Ali Franco. So I want to say Maria Ali Presente which means Marielle is among us, she is present. So I want to go straight into the democratic and progressive responsive to say that it's ironic that we are celebrating the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So I always studied constitutional law. So it was an evolution in the sense of giving a primacy to civil rights and then becoming aware that there is no primacy of civil rights over economic and social and cultural rights. My thesis, in fact, was precisely about this, the idea that civil rights are undissociable from economic, social, and cultural rights, and there are no rights that are more important than others. And this was enshrined in international law in the sense of, the, uh, the, of calling that the human rights are indivisible. So in poverty, we are all slaves. So why talk about rights of free association? 
etc. So what one of the questions that is are on the table, I won't try not to go over the same trodden ground, is that we are regressing historically and this indivisibility of rights is being questioned. On the conservative agenda, one of the points of the agenda, the conservative and fascist agenda, is the crushing of social rights and this um, hyper-liberal capital, capitalist liberalization being uh, sanctified, which means the racial supremacy, the crushing of minorities, and Bolsonaro has actually said minorities have to submit to majorities. That is denying the essence of democracy. Fundamental rights are counter-majoritarian. And so he stated that the essence of non-democracy in that speech he made a week before the election. So this is the fas fascism in action, the idea that it's that it is legitimate to a political camp to say that social rights are not part of the agenda. That had ceased to be legitimate. Of course, the left always gave more primacy to social rights than the right wing, but within the democratic camp, none of the currents to the left or the right could throw away the social rights. And what is happening right now is a historical regression to the times where we hadn't advanced uh, with the substance of the International Pact of Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. So I think we have to take uh, note of what happened in Portugal. There was no far right rise. There was a right wing government, traditional right wing government, that was a coalition between the two conservative Portuguese parties that had to fulfill a program of foreign intervention that was highly restrictive, ultra-liberal, restrictive of social rights, but it was a government that was punitive, highly liberal, that used this program as a pretext to put into practice its true ideology, which was anti-social rights, anti-poor, anti public employees destroying civil and labor rights. And so one of the objectives that they aimed, which was to have budget uh, rigor, uh, reducing the deficits. And when they, when the elections of 2015 came about, in fact, the PSD, the biggest of the right-wing parties, won the elections, had the biggest parliamentary group. We don't have a presidentialist system. It's semi-presidential, but the government is the, uh, is the cabinet, and the government's legitimacy is based on parliament. So what happened is what I think can be one of the answers, a democratic answer, a progressive answer against uh, extreme or extreme right movements, totalitarian movements, whatever they may be. What happened is that for the first time in the democratic history of Portugal, there was no longer a right-wing monopoly, but rather alliances that came to power. Since uh, 1974, we had a monopoly of right or center right for the power. And it was the first time the Socialist Party and the Communist Party and the Ecologist Party, the Green Party, together with other left uh, blocs, sat down on the table respecting the differences and saying, we have to forget our differences and put a lock to this austerity and punitive policy to the poor, this policy that is, is stealing pensions, wages, privatizing furiously essential sectors of society. And we are going to make together the government. It seems possible the first time we heard of this, but it's true that they sat down. The Socialist Party was the largest party that we are in power. 
but the other left-wing parties support the Socialist Party in Parliament. And that is uh, how what people call us the gimmick. But we say it is a gimmick, but it does work. And we adopted a name, uh, 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 and we adopted uh, the term um, dearly. Of course, we have differences uh, among each other. Uh, socialists are not communists, are not uh, ecologists. I mean, uh, we have differences, but we had uh, an objective in common to put an end to austerity, to reverse evil policies. And we had agreements between the Socialist Party and the Communist Party and with these parties and the left-wing bloc to return wages, pensions, and put into practice a set of progressive measures to represent the minimum possible possible uh, for the common good. And we a bit, uh, abided by the agreements. In the beginning, they said uh, horrible things about us. But for the fourth year in a row, we had our budget approved. And we were able not only to meet the agreements we had with the left, but also the terrible objectives, I believe, and here I'm talking uh, individually, uh, uh, objectives that were imposed by Europe. So we're able to meet all the objectives, objectives we were committed with. We are able to remove uh, Portugal from the regressive deficit, progressive deficit uh, uh, pathway. We are not subject to sanctions, so we succeeded. And I must say that this agenda that uh, deals with pensions, wages, uh, social advances that were revoked uh, by previous administrations, uh, things that were important as basic yield for the older minimum wage. People would say it was the destruction of uh, the society, subsidies for vacations for end of year the right uh, to interrupt pregnancy. Uh, in the last day we were to pass, uh, in the last day that the parliament had to again decided to leave women to a clandestine possibility, uh, uh, going back years of advance. And our number one project was to resume the right to women interrupt their pregnancy up to 10 weeks of pregnancy. So this, in this, we succeeded. And this is a law I believe is essential. It is a law that again was in effect since 2007 and has to do with a major victory against phenomena that are happening in Brazil with Bolsonaro, for instance, to win the fight of abortion is to win the fight against a state managing your lives. I think that we have to respect religious freedom, but we cannot have uh, uh, an evangelical group as you have in parliament. This is not right. So to have a state that is uh, secular is absolutely paramount. Of course, Portugal is no oasis, and even compared to what is going on in the rest of Europe, we have to understand that uh, we have uh, far-right uh, parties in 10 countries in Europe. But Portugal is enjoying a very good uh, point in time now. Things can change. Uh, the government may be obliged to take measures that are not so pleasant to the population. And therefore, things can change as of them. I think it's essential, however, as it has been mentioned before, to defend the social agenda and workers. Women, of course, 
to have an anti-corruption policy from the left, not leave this agenda to the right as if uh, we had a moral divide in there. And you can think of that thinking of the Bolsonaro history. Also to have a security policy of the left. Once again, do not leave this discourse to the right alone. And to have true civil education in schools, teaching kids about our history, where we come from, our past. I think it's essential to know about our past so that people can understand when they hear something fascist, when they hear a discourse, Bolsonaro, Trump-like, that these echo a history that has already happened. And it is crucial for schools not only have parties, but schools that take party with regard to history. And that is very important. So if we have all that, of course, there are failures, but we can succeed. And another thing that we have to face in Portugal is another danger. It's true that in Portugal, we don't have far right as strong as other countries we heard about today. But there is an agenda in progress. There is social communication, and there is funding for this to make center-left and right countries, uh, parties, I'm sorry, as hyper-liberal as possible, as conservative as possible. This agenda is in place, and the money is in place. And there is a temptation here and there from the leaders of these parties, uh, in this case, one man and a woman, of providing some political answers, even to questions asked by journalists, and that are not really based on their conviction, or at least I think so, but thinking about voters that will be behind this radical or extreme agenda. So instead of shutting those people away, they are afraid of losing them, and they talk to them. So it was quite repulsive to see leaders of uh, the Portuguese right wing. When they were asked what they would have done if they were in Brazil, they said that they would abstain to vote. All left wing uh, persons said they would vote for a dad. And in the case of France, I remember it very well. Clearly, no party even CDS, that is the farthest right, to the Communist uh, Party, uh, the left. We have uh, um, no closeness to Macron, but obviously everybody said that between a Democrat and a fascist, we would support Macron. And I remember the criticism that we suffered for taking a little more than one day to support him. But the truth of the matter is that it was not unanimous between politicians to clearly choose between a Democrat, a righteous man that works in the democratic space, whether you like or not PT, I like it, it would be a vote for my heart, and a person that was clearly in the anti-democratic arena with his attachment to torture, to military dictatorship, a man that pretended to represent everything that a leader should not, at least not a democratic leader, everything you should reject. So I think what we have to do is really to advocate for rights, and to really assume that those new ways of communication will be stronger, and we have to be ready for them. It's no use uh, being unprepared. And in times of crisis, where what is at stake is the victory of a fascist, we have to set differences apart, and we have to unite Democrats and leftist progressive because uh, people who had the power of uh, uh, their words, uh, Fernando Henrique Ciro, really missed a historical time in their lives. They did. 
they missed an opportunity. And I know my time is uh, almost over, but I would like to close by saying the following. The founder of my party and one of the founder of Portuguese democracy, Mari Soares, always said, you are only defeated when you give up fighting. And another important thing to me is that I am certain uh, it's no use uh, hating. Uh, you learn from hatred, but there are very effective ways to hate uh, the blacks, the lesbians, the gays, the poor. So we cannot just forget these agendas, the LGBTs, things that the youngsters want the left wing to embrace, and the Socialist Party and the Communist Party and the left wing bloc in Portugal uh, have embraced uh, this agenda. And it's also hard to uh, unlearn how to hate. But again, you're only defeated if you stop fighting. Lula Livre. Thank you so much, Isabel. I just have an announcement before we go on to the next panelist, to Javier. Tomorrow, uh, December 11th, you have to wear your uh, badges. Do not forget them because they are not going to be replaced tomorrow. So for obvious reasons, we know why we have to have our name tags and you have to keep them for tomorrow. Okay? Do not forget them. Well, thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak in Spanish. My uh, mixed Portuguese and Spanish is very bad, but I'm going to speak slowly. So first of all, I know. First of all, I would like to thank the invitation of uh, Foundation Perso Abramo, um, a brotherly financial of uh, the Foundation of Uruguay uh, for the invitation uh, of the Frente Ampla of Uruguay. The Lula Livre uh, Front, uh, I am part of it. Uh, I am a partner of you. And uh, so I would like to say to my comrades of uh, the Workers' Party, uh, we have a long history together. And uh, uh, I am here for a political reason, to claim for a common task of the left in the region, but also to give my testimony and participate and continue to be part of this movement. Uh, we're going to make a brief presentation answering the call for our panel in three different times. I'm going to talk about the political moment we are going through and thinking of a collective uh, reflection about what's going on. Then we are going, I'm going to talk about the 70th anniversary of the Declaration of Human Rights and uh, the reflection of democracy and human rights that we propose. And third, to talk about uh, alternatives from the left and from progressive front to the challenges of today's democracy. I talked about the political time in which we live. I believe that we have to understand the material basis of a capitalist society today. With that, we can help understand the political process we are going through in the world today. We live in a society and in a mode of capitalistic production that is supported. And it's not the first time that uh, the capitalist process is going through. And we can identify this process with three major items, robotization, platform economies that change the material basis of society and the relationship of production. 
and that uh, interferes in the very own form of uh, social organization, the Internet of Things that is coming, artificial intelligence that challenges us humans. There is a deep process of transformation going on in the capitalist production world, and that generates transformations also at the level of consciousness and organization of a society. Let me mention two notes that I believe are characteristics of the situation today, but thinking about the people, people of flesh and bones, each one of us that we live on the day-to-day -day, these situations. We've always had fear of change. We've always feared change. There's fear of these transformations, of losses, the loss of work, the loss of what we had and even of what we didn't have, the loss of certain values that were enshrined, naturalized, the family established um, a single model of family, like Maria de Rosario said, this stereotypified family, and the right uses this. And we are also living in a world of uncertainty. That principle of uncertainty has been uh, enunciated uh, over a hundred years ago, but the, the, the level of uncertainty is higher than ever. So this is translated to our day-to-day -day lives, thinking about the future of our children, what school they're going to have, how that, what education they're going to get, how they're going to earn a living, what air are they going to breathe. And the response from the right once again, in a summarized form, they've been able to capitalize on that discontent and organize that discontent of making the most of this discontentment. So the response has been proposed by the right. Once again, using emotions, irrationality, and appeal to simplifications, the caricature of reality, which is easy to channel and uh, with the help of uncertainty and this appeal to irrationality and the fake gods of security. doesn't matter if we are believers or, or atheists or agnostics, but the search for a certainty in society. So we reinvented God once again. So, once again, the human being creates God in his own image and similarity. So the fake gods of security, those that say here about the traditional values, and even more dangerous, of the identities, particularly the nationalist identities, this leads to the abandonment of the secular state. So that they're, they're proposing once again a moral state, as if there were a scale of moral values that could be known objectively. So the abandonment of the secular state, so in Brazil there aren't 15, 15 million fascists. There aren't. What there are is a population that feels the uncertainty, that has fears, and that we haven't been able to reverse and to translate in terms of mobilization and cohesion. I remember, Jorge, when in Argentina, they, you were saying, uh, let them all, let's get rid of them all. So once again, this is not new, democracy under threat. There's no collective project. So, and we are, we are, we are, we are given these so-called political outsiders. This outsider that had 28 years in parliament in Brazil, 
So the new savior, so Trump's, Macron's anti-system, anti-system candidates, this kind of saviors, this is an affirmation of anti-politics, the denial of politics as a form of structuring society. Haven't you heard that here in Brazil, in all over Brazil? You heard that, we're tired of politics, the right bets on the non-mobilization of political, non-political mobilization of society because it's a way of controlling, it's a form of taking forward a hegemonic process, processes, and simultaneously violence. The violence as form of relations that excludes, that builds enemies. I have a whole catalog of all the silliness of the president has been saying since 1997. Some of them they said we're going to kill the, the Reds. So this generates violence, polarization. There's two very important, two important texts. Amin Malouf, who is a Lebanese who lives in France, he called about assassin identities and also Amartya Sen's reflection about identity and violence. So rethink the the logics of identity that generate enemies. Let's be careful. We in the left built our en build our enemies. That is not build functional in building violence in society based on the stigmatization the, of those that don't agree with us. It's a risk to us, to ourselves, this polarization. It's a strategic risk. Second chapter. 70 years of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We are all products of our history, of the build-up of our lives. None of us, uh, our thoughts are also uh, the result of the build-up of all of our experiences. So there is a structural relationship between democracy and human rights. So those theoreticians like Norberto Bobbio, who was one of the chief thinkers about democracy in the 20th century, who talked about democracy in procedural terms, like rules of a game, ends up accepting some preconditions for democracy. Of course, the rules of the majority is the rule of, de of democracy. The rules of the majority is one of the key rules of democracy. but the. That, but the majority does not legitimize an anti-democratic discourse. The majority doesn't legitimize the principles and values that you convey. I had a big struggle in Uruguay because of your, and it was the critique. Because of you, the Brazilians, people who said, the fact that the fascist won a majority doesn't make him a Democrat. Ibsen said that in The Enemy of the People, the majority does not uh, achieve reason for reason's sake, does not legitimize the vote, the, the does not the legitimize the exclusion, the anti-human rights discourse. Of course, political rights are f the founding blocks of democracy. But as Bob, you said, they require other rights that he calls preconditions. And in as much as they are necessary, they are part of the substantial democracy, which is what Jorge Tayana said, and this is a challenge for you too. The rights, the freedoms, there are no political rights that are possible and construction of democracy without freedom of expression, rights to associate and information. Of course there aren't. We can't build democracy even from the left without those rights. But there are other preconditions, which is the, the, the guarantee of a minimum uh, living standard. 
with an, with an empty stomach because you're hungry, because we have children who can't de develop themselves intellectually because they are undernourished. They have too much lead in their bloodstream because they don't have adequate food. They don't have right to education. So, so the rights are undissociable. So, we, so Marx said it's not enough to interpret reality, we have to transform it. So what are the alternatives for the left? In the normative and the values, and you mentioned this, Isabel, we cannot turn our backs on the defense of democracy in all of its dimension, political, social, liberal, civil, etc. Reaffirm our principles, our social constructs, honesty. Being left-winger means is a form of life, it's a solution. It involves certain principles that make us uh, behave honestly in every step of our lives. A critique, a rational critique, and self-critique with humility and solidarity. So in the strategic field, unity of the little that this con little country of mine with uh, only three million inhabitants, Uruguay, we can teach is the value of the unity. Here are communists, social democrats. Uh, we form for 50 years the unity of the left. And this we are three terms in the presidency and we're going to win a fourth term because unity is a value, an essential value in the construction of being left wing. Of course we have vile, we have differences, of course. Do we fight? A lot. But we close ranks in a that without losing our identity we form a logic a coalition and with that logic we can win. Yeah. We are not Geringonza like in Portugal, but we are like a quilt made up from different uh, textiles, fragments of, of cloth. So we are the children of tortured people, of murdered people, of exiles. We have hope, we have confidence. This is what Mexico teaches the example of Portugal that is able to build a progressive government beyond the unification of forces collaborating with transformation. And let us not forget Bolivia that is still fighting. Let's wait that these people from Uruguay are able to renew hope next year, above all with rebelliousness. That's our commitment that we stand by. Thank you. It is now 12 minutes past three, so we have time for some debate. We're going to open up for contributions from the floor until 3.40. So then we give our panelists a 15 minute uh, uh, period. So if you can speak for less than three minutes, please do so. So, from the order that I received the credentials. So, you have three minutes, but if it's less, all the better. Because then we can have more speakers. Microphone for you have. Okay, I'm going to speak. I'm from the Israeli Communist Party. I bring you revolutionary greetings and free Lula from my party. For 10 years, we have the far right in power. And we have 
serious difficulties, not just in the reduction of democratic rights, but also the difficulty in building a front, a broad front, because there are forces in the center left that are looking to the right. They have a pro-security or pro-religious discourse that sometimes has this tendency. When people want to take power, they, they want to kiss the ass, so to speak, of the right. And that is a major difficulty for us, and we have to be careful in any front that we build or try to build. But there is a strong struggle happening against the occupation of Palestine and the missions that the United States delegates to Israel for their local interests in the, in the Middle East. Right now, they have uh, charged Israel with an operation in Lebanon to secure American interests against Syria and Iran and Hezbollah and Lebanon. And they use Israel as a proxy, persuading the Israeli people that it's in their interests. And this is something that makes it very difficult because the center left, uh, when the time comes, if it's the safety of Israel, we uh, stop protesting because we are pro-patriotic. It's very important to separate between the government and the people. And it is very important when we talk about Israel that there is this tendency to criticize Israel or boycott Israel and forget that the, there's a people there, that half of it wants peace, just like Roger Waters wanted to boycott. I thought it was uh, during the military dictatorship in Brazil, Mercedes Sosa, the show that she came to Brazil was one, a crack in the dictatorship's strength. We don't need to fight against BDS movement, boycott, divest. Um, and there's a people there, and sometimes we forget that people have power. I am a grandchild of survivors of the Holocaust. I have, I have, I could go to Auschwitz for three reasons: as Jew or gay, or as a communist. So I'm the nemesis of the far right, and I'm active in the creation of a broad front, bringing you greetings from our peoples and saying Lula Libre. Thank you. Okay, Andresa, then Pietro. I'm from the, the, la, the, the homeless movement. I'm from the National Coordination of, of Black Organizations. It is a challenge for the left globally to rethink its forms of political organization so as to incorporate structures to the more recent formats of people's movements, noticing that they are unfoldings of our actions that allow new identities and new forms of action to emerge in the search for rights, spaces of power, and decision-making power, actual decision-making power. We are threatened of becoming outdated owing to the speed of adaptation of capital uh, with the use of technology and communication in politics. We need to change our form of action internationally, bringing together parties, organizations, resistance groups around an anti-capitalist uprising which is progressive in favor of people's democracy and for a human rights agenda. We are not just fighting for over governments, but many changes in the system of dem democratic decision-making for 
parliaments with seats reserved for people's movements that can uh, protect us from the hijacking of parliaments by capital, which bring about regressions. So I want to conclude by saying that democracy must, must be the power of people's organizations and all, in all their diversity. We no longer the right, left, uh, Democrats, uh, Republicans, communists and capitalists, an end for pol polarizations, for long-lasting decisions based on consensus to bring forth a new era where politicians are replaced by politics. Good afternoon. I'm going to speak Portuguese, but I represent the Colombian forces that were present in the Sao Paulo Forum, specifically the Communist Party of Colombia. Taking into consideration what uh, we have heard here today in the morning and also in this afternoon's panel, it seems to me that there are some points that should be highlighted in the light of this uh, strong answer we have to give to the fascistoid movements we have in the continent. The first is to resume the experience of unity. We have had advances uh, of the friends of fascism, what we call dictator democracies, but we also have responses to that. Uh, and I would like to tell you, after a long and painful process of peace that we had in our country, uh, not without difficulties and conversations in Havana, the left in Colombia had uh, the largest amount of votes in a very difficult electoral battle against an administration that has been fascist for long in the country. And it is by means of union of political democratic forces that we were able, after several attempts, exploring ways, methods, conversations. It is hard, but it is possible. And it is by means of this methodology, by exploring possibilities, that we were able to move forward. So I think there are important positive elements to provide this response. But as someone said in the Sao Paulo Forum, right now union is a matter of political survival and that we will enable us to go from resistance to alternative. The second issue that seems to me extremely relevant is to discuss the scenario of uh, regional security and peace. The meeting in Foz de Iguaçu came with a very concrete proposal of creating a kind of uh, conclusion of uh, popular governments that we have uh, in Latin America, because we still have Venezuela, Nicaragua, and Cuba. So we have to think of uh, the regional security and peace and also defend what was built in integration processes, particularly the proposals that we have that are still valid and that are completely opposite to what uh, the Organization of the American States wants to impose to us. And also the state of welfare and legality, not only because we are committed with liberal democracies, but that enables us to accrue forces for a transformation that is more solid. And we have to pay attention to the violation of procedural processes. I'm part of the Association of Brazilian uh, Legalists, I'm not Brazilian, but I'm part of this group. Corrupts and corruption is the way capitalism survives and repro reproduces. They are the corrupt. Therefore, Lula Livre. Lula Livre.
Cola Livre, and now we have Walter and then Maite. Well, good afternoon. I'm Valde Pomar, Professor of International Relations at the Federal University of Recife. I'd like to talk about this controversy of uh, the sanitary divide, uh, which is very uh, controversial because the first time it was used, it was a seize against the Soviet Union for people not to come out. But it was used by the friend of Podenus in uh, an opposite direction. He said the sanitary divide should divide part of social democracy and part of the right that are responsible for the essential of the right. And Celso Marins contraposed to that. He said the sanitary divide should be a bit more towards the right. I don't think that's the right way to uh, think of the matter. I think that if you need to build a front, whatever you want to call it, is to defend the rights of our people in the most broad sense of the world. That is, we cannot do away with defending the interest of Brazilians. Uh, any waving to the right or to the center in exchange to doing away with the fight against the pension reform that is proposed by the right or the labor reform or the fight against the destruction of the union movement by right-wing parties. If we do away with, uh, with that uh, uh, on behalf of uh, including a front more towards the center, this front will not be able to establish a dialogue with our people. For me, that's uh, the basics. And if you respect that, no matter who comes, whoever come, we'll have to respect our dialogue with the remainder of our population. We did have problems in the past. We had problems in our campaign of making mistakes of the kind. And we're not successful to bring together right or right-wing sectors. We did bring on voters, but not important leaderships, as Isabel Moreira mentioned, Fernando Henrique Cardoso and Ciro. And it's not a matter of election. After the election, there are sectors that did not vote for Bolsonaro and said they will make a specific one-off opposition. What does it mean? That they agree with part of the agenda that is going to be implemented by Bolsonaro. Other sectors uh, supported by Ciro saying Bolsonaro is not a threat to democracy. Open brackets. It, it, he is a threat to PT. Close brackets. But he did say it's not a threat. He's not a threat to democracy. So if you are working with the theory of isolating PT, you're talking about a broad front without counting on a party that had 31 million votes. So I think that we have yeah. to give a new name to our problem. Thank you. Maite and then Alexandre. My dear. Well, I'm going to be very quick. I'm going to speak Spanish. I represent 37 European parties. We call ourselves the party of the European left. Uh, uh, the, I am Spanish. I am from uh, the Basque countries, and I am from the party Izquierda Unida. So what I would like to say to our comrades is that uh, union, and this is good news, has been established in the Spanish state. And we are together with the groups of Gales, the communes of Catalonia and Valencia, and the Green Party. So we built something that we didn't have 50 years ago and the times of Peron. And this is something we are not going to do away with. It is a strategic issue. It is true that in Andalusia we had complicated elections, but I have two questions to ask. First, do you think that the presence of Steve Bannon associating 
to Bolsonaro and Trump was uh, important for Bolsonaro to come from nothing to the victory. And the second question is, what happens to extension? I haven't, uh, to abstention, I'm sorry. I haven't heard of the phenomenon of abstention. Why is it going on? Why not more than 50% of population voted in Andalusia? Um, it is important for us to address, uh, progressive forces have to address this population that is not voting. So this is something that we have to consider. And on behalf of the 37 parties that I come here to represent, Lula Livre. Thank you. Maite. Now we have Alexandre and then Pedro Paulo Bastos. Good afternoon. I'm Alexandre Pupo. I'm a militant of uh, the Workers' Party Young Movement, and it's a pleasure to be talking to Celso Amorim today. I think that the panel uh, put some organizational challenges uh, for the left in the world. I would like to address specifically what Javier mentioned about the changes of the way of produce in capitalism and how capitalism is organized today. We are going through a social scenario, a class structure in many of our countries that is a result of two things, of neoliberalism that led to disaggregation and social disorganization and changes in the production production modes, the dot, uh, 4.0 industry, that changes a lot. And when organized, generates unemployment, unemployment amongst the youngsters, which is a concern of every country. And what comes to mind is how can we organize the ones that are disorganized, the contractors, the unemployed? How will trade unions work in this new order? Because the left has structured itself uh, as parties connected to the trade union structure. What kind of trade union are we going to have from now on? I'm looking at our former candidate uh, for the state of Sao Paulo. Metal workers are no longer representatives of the productive uh, uh, force of Brazil. Services have expanding. So the experience of Syriza and Podemos give us uh, organizational responses. The gimmick is a way to respond to that. But Bannon was the one that uh, organized it better, electing Trump and Bolsonaro, making politics in a different way. And I ask about the youngsters. Youngsters voted for Bolsonaro voted for Vox, voted for Ciudadanos. They were attracted by this perspective of a new politics. How can we organize the disorganized? There is a political key, but it goes through organization. There are new ways to organize and to be present that we have to understand. And I would like to hear your experience. Also, when Paolo Estrada mentioned this morning, I would like to greet the Bolivarian Sandinist companions that are here and that are holding tight in a difficult moment of Latin America. Lula Livre. Pedro Paulo, then Luis Pedro. We have three more. We are going to make an effort. And then we have seven minutes for three people. So let's make an effort for us to be able to hear you three and then have time for our last panel. I have two questions. One related to the sui generis characteristics of Bolsonaro. Indeed, Bolsonaro, Bolsonaro is an authoritarian but he does not appeal to the nationalistic issue. 
uh, as you have in Eastern Europe, like Putin or Ban. He appeals to neoliberalism, so very different from Turkey, for example. And that, to me, brings a major contradiction because the popular mass was attracted by a moral speech, but also uh, to a promise of economic improvement. Uh, they were not connecting their problems to the problems of capitalism. They were talking about morality. But they are very susceptible to an extension of the economic crisis. And neoliberal authoritarianism is complicated. One thing is to be neoliberal when you have a strong currency. Another thing is to be neoliberal when the markets are going out, the economy is retracting, the interest rates in the US are going crazy. And to have a program that cuts 140 billion reals to close the primary deficit will bring economic crisis. So how, the first question, if I can ask another, it's okay. But first, how can you talk to this population that was certainly attracted by a moral discourse, but that indeed voted otherwise because they did not want to the socioeconomic problems that were going on to be reproduced. And they will certainly deteriorate even more in a new liberal program. The second question, implementing a program such as this when the country is in hegemony is one thing. That's what the US did. Ronald Reagan went to a new conservatist, uh, conservative base. He had the support of the Anglican Church. They were talking about the welfare king, the moral issue, the blacks and drugs, social movements that had engaged into what they called the generative of the American character. So Reagan changed the world order to implement a policy for the mass, including the middle class. Now, when you are going to build a progressive international move with a candidate that can win the elections in the US in 2020, isn't it time to talk to them and think together with them and the left to wing European parties a program to change the institutions that consolidated this neoliberalism? The proposals of uh, Bernie Sanders to the IMF for corporations and etc. Luis Pedro, and finally, Ligia. Quite quick, yeah, I, quick. I'm Luis Pedro. I'm just an affiliate to the party, and I would like you to resume violence. You mentioned in violence the execution of uh, the members from MST, and Maria do Rosario also addressed that in the morning, how Bolsonaro supporters used uh, this problem of Brazilian society to bring supporters. We have to think of progressive measures to fight violence and expose their paradox. In March this year, an LGBT a black councilwoman in Rio was killed together with her driver, and one candidate, uh, our candidate, I'm sorry, the candidate to the presidency said he wouldn't say anything. Later on in his campaign, supporters of his party just tear off the plates of Marielle Franco. So we cannot uh, let these political assassinations uh, be quiet. Today, death penalty in Brazil is not only legal, it is encouraged. OK, Luis Pedro, your name tag. Otherwise, tomorrow you won't be able to get in. 
And Lisa, you're last. Thank you. I'll try to be quick. I'm Lisa Chiappiki. I was professor of the University of Sao Paulo, then retired, and then professor of the Free University of Berlin, also retired. I had the honor to was the only and last uh, professoral position of literature, uh, Brazilian literature, in a time that people like you had given Brazil an importance that made us very proud. Well, that's past, and now we are where we are today. I'm also the daughter of a communist that was arrested. Panfilio Capini uh, was arrested twice, was in prison twice, and I was born in Uruguay when he exiled in Rivera. So I have uh, triple citizenship, Uruguay, Italy, and Brazil. Uh, most of my time now, I live in Berlin, and uh, we work in the Lula Livre Committee in Berlin. And one of the questions I had for you is how you think we can be more useful there? Because we carry out several actions. We establish partnerships with people from the left. We hold events. We have our banners. We have our pamphlets. But I feel uh, lots of difficulties to leave the scope of Brazilians only and truly establish a dialogue with the Germans, even progressive Germans. And I feel there is some ambiguity there because the interests against Brazil are many and are widespread. And you don't know exactly where people are, what they support, what they don't. To this end, I believe this external interference that was approached uh, uh, today in the successive coups that we had is very important. At first, I think President Dilma underestimated that. Uh, I don't know if it was her strategy, but I think that she underestimated that. And I think the risks of uh, foreign interference should be better understood so that we can know who we can talk to against these interests, even from the outside. To conclude, I'd like to talk another risk. As a professor of language and literature, I would like to warn all of us for t about the fragility and fragmentation that people find themselves in today owing to the influence of communication via WhatsApp and other such uh, modes, which are very good. I use them myself, but have the risk of uh, addicting people and dumbing down people in the sense that people no longer have time to think, to reflect. There's only time to say three quick sentences and you cannot understand a short text within WhatsApp. And I think the solution for this is education with books and teachers. Reading is a, a, a book is a weapon. Within the Bolsonaro perspective, he wants to banish books and banish education with teachers. They want to have education at a distance via the internet. I think there's no coincidence there. So I suggest that each of you, we're going to start in the same order. Chema's already left. So five minutes each to, to conclude, OK? If you, you want to use only three, there's no problem. Ah, okay, it's all a question of, of uh, point of view. 
the left of the stage from looked at from the public is from the right. How to organize the non organize if I knew how? That's the challenge. If I knew the answer, wow. What is the unionism of the future? What is clear is that the way of organizing society that we built cannot respond to the the base of society. So we have to think about it. Chema has left, but I think Podemos gives us an example of how we can become closer to new associations of civil society that have other logics, that have other demands. And what we see in the more traditional left is that we don't manage to understand these new logics. Sirisa is also an expression of this, but in Brazil there's an experience that we have missed out on. Do you remember the the grassroots uh, Catholic uh, organizations, the liberation theologians of the 70s, the everyday grassroots work? We have to talk about this. Remember Ernesto Cardenal, the Nicaraguan revolution. These are processes that we have to take up again because the society is also organized on that basis, on a neighborhood basis. So Nectarius was saying this morning about internationalism and open internationalism. These calls, we can like them more or less, but we need to have spaces that are broad, that are internationalist and broad. So there's internationalist Socialist international, the progressive internationalists, we, that's fine, but we need to keep cultivating them. But we need broader spaces. We have to look at Bernie Sanders. So we need to. We have to provide responses to these new forms of organization such as Bannon has been disseminating all over Europe. So, somebody said that the Portuguese experience had been enough to contain the politics of the right. We were able to develop progressive forces as well. So or go to the precarious workers. One of the forms of bringing the precarious workers to, to, to reality is to develop public policies to regulate the precarious workers, regulate the precarious workplaces. So once you're organized, it doesn't solve the whole problem, but it's a way to formalize, to bring them into a dignified existence. Regarding abstention, I think we have to go back to our grassroots work through associations, door to door. This idea that voters is one reality and politics is another reality. No, we are all politicians and we all have the same reality. So that's essential. And the right has doing very well, at least in Portugal, but in other countries I imagine it's the same and the left has less organized. Each are centers for producing political thought about or, or, or policy thought for labor, for the environment. This is done nationally and internationally. I think this is fundamental. Thank you. Thank you. There are many interesting points raised. I can't address all of them. So he said that he was disorganized. I was disorganized for 68 years. I, people tried to, Lula had to say, so I, I was, a, I was a briefly a member uh, of the PMDB party in the past during the fight for democracy. And in the last year of the Lula government, I ended up joining the Workers' Party, which has allowed me to be here among you, for instance, among other uh, reasons. Walter Poma makes a very interesting point. I use the cordon sanitary uh, 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 term because Chema had used it. The dividing line is, would be a better term. I think the problem that is put is the following. One thing is to have a project for power. 
and then the dividing line perhaps is different because you're fighting to achieve power. That is, has to do with what you said. Me personally, without getting into polemical, I was never, I was never been very much in favor of making, you know, uh, winking at the market. Yeah? I think that would make no difference. A different thing is when you're fighting to keep a space of democracy, without which. I think the fight for the space of freedom, which has to be through a broad front, does not exclude that certain specific sectors loot for their, fight for their interests and values. For example, the fight against the fight against the pension reform as proposed by the right has to continue. So you're gonna call somebody from the PSDB, let's say Goldman, who was one of the few who declared Haddad. If I invite Goldman, maybe we won't agree about the pension system reform. But so there's a space where we can agree, and there's other uh, a space where we can't agree. So I'm not saying that we have to abdicate from our own struggles. That would be absurd. I think the party we all have to fight against the reform, the the so-called anti-reforms, the labor market reform, pension system reform. We have to fight for the national side, which is not so relevant in Europe, but in Brazil is fundamental. For example, the national oil company, the airline company that is in the process of being bought out by Boeing, etc. But when you have a threat, it's a question of evaluation. We have a fascistic threat or not. If we do, then I think the fight for freedom it must become essential, absolutely essential. So. If under fascism there's no space to fight against racism, to fight against all the forms of discrimination that have been mentioned here before. So I think it's two different things. We don't you don't have to abdicate to yield on your slogans, your objectives, but at the same time, yes, you have to seek to have an alliance as broad as possible to with those that stand up for democracy. And it is those may go a little bit beyond uh, the progressive camp. So that's the, the distinction. So many interesting questions were raised So about Trump and Reagan and what each one represented. I think these are different moments. I think what is curious about Trump, as somebody who dealt with the international uh, arena for a long time. Trump is the first U.S. president since the Second World War that at least explicitly did not have a project for the world or the so-called free world. All the other ones had a project. In one way or another, they, they cloaked the defense of U.S. interests within a project for a global project, and Trump didn't. What makes it more str strange is that there is an international organization of this right-wing populism. So I want to raise your attention to something that is very curious, that Steve Bannon, in a fantastic interview, because of the questions, not because of the answers, by Patricia Campos Melo, he said that he liked Bolsonaro because he was a nationalist. I, that stayed in my mind. In what sense? if he's an ultra-neoliberal, but I understand the sense. Having been a, a minister and a UN uh, representative of Brazil at the UN, the nationalism that he sees in Bolsonaro and he sees an identity with Trump is the anti-multilateralism, is the non-respect for international norms. So, for example, the so when there was a judgment from the, the High Justice Court. So when the Committee of Human Rights, uh, it is the body of the treaties, the most important than the General Assembly of the UN or the Security Council because it has the right to, because it can use force. But anyway, it's more important than the General Assembly. That the, it is the body that defines whether that was actually a violation or not. But the 
intervention was from a jurist was also said by a military chief, but it's more uh, astonishing to have been said by a high-level jurist in Brazil when he said, we will not bend ourselves, we will not bend to the UN, we will not bow to the international norm. So, quote unquote, there's a nationalism there that approximates Trump and Bolsonaro, it's something curious that hasn't been sufficiently highlighted. Uh, there were many things to comment. I want to say a special thank you to our friends from abroad. Uh, that both are great examples in their respective countries. Thank you. Okay, tomorrow we should start at 9 o'clock sharp, so please be in the hall at 9. So we are five minutes early, so I ended up taking five minutes away from our fantastic uh, debate. So now we can't reopen the debate. So let's go. Thank you.